myself. Uh, my name is Chad, and I am a PHP developer first, a uh, WordPress developer most recently. And uh, my experience in PHP has been a very long one and with a lot of different PHP technologies. I uh, started out building sites using a product called Joomla. Has anyone ever heard of Joomla before? Oh, yes, the shutter, the shutter over here. All right, fair enough, fair enough. Um, I spent about eight years building uh, sites on WordPress. It's not quite as shutterful as he makes it seem, but uh, certainly can be, I guess. Um, so really what I'm telling you is I'm not a WordPress developer, really. I'm not. I am, I'm very new to the WordPress world. I've been building WordPress sites, I'm going to say, two months at this point. So clearly, I'm the most experienced person that you could have on this stage telling you about how to do things properly in WordPress. Um, so really, I'm a Joomla guy. Uh, I have spent some time doing things in Laravel. I've spent time doing things in Symfony. All around, I consider myself a decent PHP programmer uh, and most recently, a WordPress user, developer, person. Um, that's how it goes. I work with Laravel and WordPress now. I love PHP frameworks. I have a passion for PHP frameworks. Uh, does anyone know what a PHP framework is by definition or, or kind of boiled down to its most abstract? You want to go ahead. Raise your hand. Oh, oh you, you know what it is? All right. PHP frameworks are essentially libraries of deep coupled code that PHP developers can pull into projects to build PHP applications. So essentially what we would say about WordPress is WordPress has a PHP framework, which are the hooks and action systems that's built into WordPress. And then WordPress is built on top of that, and that's the application built on top of those libraries. So other examples of PHP frameworks out in the wild are things like Symfony and Laravel. Uh, if you're familiar with Drupal, Drupal just picked up a bit of Symfony code in their latest release. They're refactoring all of Drupal to be based on a PHP framework called Symfony. Uh, so I love PHP frameworks. I enjoy building applications on them. Other things that I like are good code. I like good code. I like good standards. I like high quality code. I like readable code, code that I can read and it just speaks to me and tells me exactly what it's doing without me having to spend a lot of time on it. I'm going to hopefully teach you some techniques that I've learned about how to write good code and what I think good code looks like. Here's where I'm going to start losing people. Uh, all right. I love object-oriented programming. I love, yes, where's the woo? Way back, yes. Object-oriented programming for the win. All right. I know that this is possibly controversial at a WordPress conference. No? Good. I'm, I'm glad to hear it. I, I was talking about this uh, last night with uh, some other speakers and, and people who had organized the conference, and they're like, oh, man, I don't know about that object-oriented stuff. So I'm glad that there's some people here who've, who've adopted it. Uh, the other thing that I really like is documentation. Uh, documentation is huge, hugely important for making your application or your framework or your code, your, your uh, plugin, whatever it is you're building, documentation is essential. The other place that documentation is absolutely essential is in the code that you're writing. So things like doc blocks, inline comments, things like that. Tell people what you're doing inside your code so that they don't have to read every single line to figure it out. Documentation, super important. And then the last thing is testing. How many people unit test? One, two, oh yes, thank you, thank you, unit testers. This code is not on unit testing, or this presentation is not on unit testing, sorry. There should be a dedicated talk for that, but I do love unit testing, and I wanted to tell you all, do unit testing, spend some time, learn how to do it. These are a few of my favorite things. Frameworks, good quality code, object orientation, all of that good stuff. That's what I love. And that's why I'm here presenting at a WordPress conference, because I want to bring what I consider these modern PHP techniques into WordPress. I want to share them with you so that you can use them and go back to your plugin that you're building or the job that you work, and you can use these modern PHP techniques in your WordPress plugin. All of that said, I want you to know that I don't think that I'm some sort of big deal because I know about these techniques, all right? I'm not a big deal. I'm not famous. You shouldn't consider me any sort of time lord or famous person or anything like that. I'm not. All right, I'm just an okay PHP developer. Not any of those things. This is probably going to end up something like this. All right, it's going to be awesome, possibly. Possibly, all right? 
So with that introduction, with you understanding a little bit about where I come from, let's go ahead and get started on this talk. Uh, and again, some of this stuff possibly a little controversial in the WordPress world, so here we go. Don't walk out, all right? It'll get, to, it'll get better, all right? The first thing that I think that we should really start doing as developers in WordPress to make our lives a little bit better is stop using themes for functionality. Stop using themes for functionality. Themes are not for doing. Themes are for presenting. They're only for presentation. Only for presentation. I make my point. Only for presentation. So here's some examples. Things that your theme should never, ever do. Should not touch things like WordPress query. Should not change your content. Should not change where your content or your URLs are going or ending up. The only thing your theme should be responsible for is loading CSS and markup into your page and enhancing your page with JavaScript. That's it. Everything else that you need to do should be done somewhere else. We'll talk about where it's all going to go in just a second. But basically, if your theme will not function the same, or your website will not function the same with a different theme, then you've done something incorrect. You've embedded functionality inside your theme, and that's not where it belongs. Now, you might be saying, Chad, I need functions.php. That's where all my stuff goes. All right, you might say that. Um, what you really need to do is you need to build a plugin. You need to figure out how to use plugins. Now, plugins are really, really simple to build. They're not complex. They're really easy. They're actually not any harder than functions.php. All right. I am fairly certain that plugins can do everything that functions.php can do inside of your theme. If I'm wrong about that or there's like one or two exceptions, come tell me and don't embarrass me in front of everyone. Um, you can tell me what, what uh, functions.php does that a plugin can't do. Um, but I'm pretty certain that uh, functions.php is not necessary when you can do stuff inside of a plugin. Now, the important thing here is that you need to be able to change your theme uh, without affecting plugins. You should be able to install a new theme and your plugin functionality should remain exactly the same. Basically, what I'm saying is plug in all the things. Just put it all in plugins. That's what you have to do. So if we're going to rely on plugins, that means I'm going to tell you a little bit about how to build plugins and how to work with plugins. And I'm going to share a story. I'm going to share a story about my first plugin experience, building my first plugin. How many people have Googled how to build a plugin in WordPress? So it's like, yes, pretty much everyone. That was your starting point. Now, there's really good news when you do that. You, you find some great things. There's documentation and tutorials everywhere. Everywhere. Everyone wants to write a tutorial on this topic. Here's an example of a search result page of how to do a WordPress plugin tutorial. Uh, and here's some of the tutorials that I found. And these are literally the ones, the very first thing that I found entering in this world, coming from my background. Uh, and it kind of was a little alarming to me, and I'll tell you why. Here's, here's the first one. This isn't all that terrible, all right? We have uh, a regular function. It's namespaced or vendor prefixed. Uh, it checks admin, and then it gets called. This is, this is OK. This is an OK example of a plugin. Here's another one. This one really caught my attention. Um, it checks to see if the function's been declared first. And then if it hasn't been declared, it'll go ahead and declare it. I understand why we're doing that, because WordPress, we have this issue with vendor prefixes and duplicate uh, function names, things like that. I understand that. Still, I probably would have done this a little bit differently. Um, but basically, what I'm saying is that there's tons of tutorials and documentation for WordPress plugins. But good coding standards and how to do it correctly is really hard to find, and you really have to search for it. So most of the information that I ended up finding was not object-oriented, which, remember, is one of the things that I love. Uh, the function names were, eh, they could have been a little bit better. They could have been a little bit more descriptive of what the function's going to do. Uh, they all require this vendor prefix thing, which, again, the function doesn't need a vendor prefix or shouldn't need a vendor prefix. It's, we need to call it what it is. And then the code style is I, inconsistent as a compliment. It's really just not there. <laughs> Um, so here's how I think that we should start doing plugins. First off, we need to have some class. We need to have some class, right? Um, Anchorman says that he wants us to be classy. So here is an example of building a plugin using a class inside of PHP. Uh, what we have here is a class. 
and it's de declared as a class right here by this first line that says class. Uh, you'll notice that it does, this is what I would call a vendor prefix, this MCO piece right here. That's your vendor prefix. Just like on a function has a vendor prefix where you've kind of said, hey, this is my version of this function, this would serve as that. But the benefit here is that all the rest of the functions can be called normal, normally and named normally without needing that vendor prefix. That's because that they are inheriting the class. They are um, basically built inside that class and contained within there. Now, if we want to do something like add filter or do action or anything else like that, normally what you do is you just pass in the title of the function that you want to execute. We can't do that inside of a class because we don't know which version of pretty title we want to use. Instead, we have to pass in this thing called an array. And the array, the array will have two uh, values in it. The first one is the instance of the class. And then the second one is the actual string which reference, references the function. All right, And what that this thing there is, is that saying that that is uh, what we want to reference in terms of the instance of the class. When this class gets declared down here by declaring the new instance, MCO class, this variable, has basically all of that stuff inside of it as an object. So when we declare that we want to do an add filter, we need to tell add filter to use MCO class to locate pretty title as the function. All of that stuff gets all wrapped together inside of that little thing. So using the this de declaration is what that's all about. All right. Now, this is a class inside of PHP, which means that we officially have an object. We have the beginning of object-oriented programming. We have the base in this class. In, in this class. But this isn't a real class inside of PHP. This is an application class. It's really like a runtime. Um, it's a sequence of things. The style of that class is what's called procedural. It kind of does everything, one thing after the other. It's not using real object-oriented features. So a few things about doing it like that. First off, it's not really object-oriented programming. It's an object, but it's written procedurally. Uh, and we have to keep that vendor prefix, which, again, not the greatest, but it's the only solution that we have until we get namespaces inside of WordPress, right? Uh, now, the benefit here is that if we ever need to change that namespace, we have one place to change it, and that's the class name. We don't have to change it 10 other times for every other single function inside the class. So it's one change, and uh, we are able to avoid the collision issue inside of functions that way. And our function names get to stay a lot better because we don't have to have that vendor prefix in there, and we know exactly what that function's going to do, and we can name it a lot better, and we are going to know what it's going to do for us. The other thing we do is we do everything like add action, add filter, all those calls. I put them into the constructor. I'm going to back up to this constructor so you can see this. Does everyone know what a construct function does inside of a class or what it's supposed to do? It's magical. Yes. Very good. Okay. The construct function is a function that is automatically executed the second that we instantiate the class. So when we say MCO class equals new MCO class example, construct immediately fires. This just happens. Now, this example right here, MCO class and then method execute, this execute method, which is right here, will only get executed if I specifically call it on the method. All right? Construct instant. This happens. This only happens if I explicitly say I want it to happen. That's the major, major difference. Now, here's a little bit of interesting uh, thing that's also going on here. Construct instantly, instantly uh, executes, right? Something else also is going to execute. What is it? Anyone tell me? Pretty title, exactly. Because construct instantly executes, pretty title is going to instantly execute right after that because it's inside the construct. So. We're going to do one thing here, new example, construct, pretty title, all in one call. All that happens instantaneously. So what we can do is then add all the things that we need to do inside of WordPress, just like we would normally do inside of a regular plugin without a class, 
but if we reference do action, add action, all that stuff inside the constructor, we don't have to recall every single method. We just add them all to the constructor, and they're all going to magically just start happening. So that's how you get this runtime type of class mm -hmm. thing to work. Now we get to do really cool things inside of PHP. We can do things like this. This is a class that is extending another class. And then you can see over here on the right, that's the class that I'm extending. So picture this. Picture inside your head here. Picture a telephone, OK? Picture this telephone, and we have the very first telephone, right? Maybe it's a Nokia or something like that. It's the first telephone, and it has two basic features. It can send calls, and it can receive phone calls. That's all that our Nokia phone can do, OK? That's it. But we can take that really basic example of the Nokia phone, and we can ship that, all right? Hey, we've got the basic features. A couple years go by, technology progresses, and now we want to add some new features to our Nokia phone. Let's say we want to add things like texting and voicemail. So rather than rewriting send and receive phone call, we extend those features by extending the class, and we get send and receive phone call, and then we add features like texting and voicemail. We still inherit those other features, but we don't have to rewrite them because we're just inheriting from them from this other class. Now let's say a few, me for a few more years go by and we want to actually change voicemail and change texting. We can extend this class and we can rewrite the send and receive voicemail functions or re rewrite the text messaging functions. And PHP's job is to figure out which one that we want to actually use. By simply redeclaring the function and saying that we're extending this other thing over here, PHP knows that we really want this version of those features rather than that version we wrote decades ago. So that's how object-oriented programming works. And this makes it really easy to inherit functionality. We get a ton of different PHP, what I call PHP wins, when we enter into this programming paradigm. All right? We get object-oriented code, which is awesome. We get reusable code which means that we don't have to rewrite things that we've already written 10 times. We enter into this thing called solid programming. Does anyone know the keyword solid or, or have, has heard it before? It stands, it's, it's a really long thing, OK? Single responsibility, open, closed, Liskov, substitution, interface segregation, and dependency inversion. That's a lot of technical babble. Basically, it means that you write code that can be reused and can extend and inherit other code really, really easily. It basically means that you're writing flexible code, code that can adapt and change as you need to adapt and change your application without having to really rewrite it all the way from scratch. That's what we're getting. Um, and we also get this other thing called dry. Does anyone know what dry is? Dry is a little more popular. Don't repeat yourself. Exactly. I hate repeating myself. I hate doing things I've done twice. So we get to be dry in this case. So why have the class? Class gives us clean, fast, reusable code, saves us time and money, and it gives us happy developers and happy users. That's object-oriented programming. OK, what else do we need to do inside of the WordPress world to be a better developer citizen, right? That's why we're here. We want to be a better developer citizen. So step one, use those classes. Step two, let's have some standards in terms of how we write code and use things inside of WordPress, all right? First thing, JavaScript injection. I've seen this gone terribly, terribly wrong inside of plugins. Uh, people do things that just don't, don't necessarily make sense. Here's an example, a bad example, of JavaScript being included inside of your WordPress site. Bad, yes. I'm glad we, OK, we agree. Oh, boy. I was worried about. All right, so this is a bad example. Does anyone know why this is a bad example, why we should not do this? Right, OK. So WordPress allows us to do it in another way. By hard, this is what we call welding, welding the functionality. We don't want to weld things inside of WordPress. We want to bolt on and bolt off, all right? We don't want to weld. Hard coding things, bad. Bolting on, good, OK? We have a WordPress hook that allows us to do it. It looks like this, all right? WP action, remember our class? WP action and queue the script executed in the constructor when, when it's instantiated automatically executes and queue the script automatically gets included. Now, here's where I honestly don't have the best solution. I think that there's probably better solutions to this problem, but I 
this is the solution that I have. This is the one that I came up with. I feel comfortable. I can sleep at night. But if you know a better solution, come find me, come tell me, because I want to know what it is. All right? Executing JavaScript from markup. Because this is the thing that we have to do sometimes. And what that means is we want to be able to say, load this JavaScript file into our site. And then when you get here, I want you to execute a method. I want you to do this thing that's defined in my JavaScript. The way that I do that is I actually do hard code the script tags here. But I'm not hard coding the script source. I'm just saying execute the method in that script source. All right? And I'm doing it based on jQuery's ready function in this case. Um, and then I'm using JavaScript over here on the left-hand side, which says check and see if a class has been defined for this particular function, where this function needs to live. And that allows us to avoid this thing called globals inside of PHP or inside of JavaScript. We don't want global variables. We want localized variables. So this gives us localized variables inside of more or less a namespace. And then we can define that the function is going to be you know, this function, and it's going to do something. Now, what this also gives us, and I apologize, I did not write an example for, um, is it gives us the ability to pass variables from our HTML, from our PHP, into our JavaScript, and then act upon them. So for example, let's say we have a map that we want to put on a page, and the map locations needs to come from a database. Well, we can use uh, PHP to pull that stuff out of the database using WordPress. We can send a list of locations passing a variable inside of here called locations. We can then parse that into load map and then plot all those locations on a map. JavaScript doesn't have to know anything about the database or anything about those locations. It's just, just taking a bunch of data and chucking it into uh, Google API. So that's how we handle that kind of stuff. Again, there might be better ways to do this. Uh, some people might prefer reading stuff directly from the DOM. I don't particularly care for that um, because I don't think that we should hard code functionality to a DOM because we want to be able to change our theme, which means the DOM's going to change possibly. So this is my preferred method. Um, better, better suggestions, I'm totally open to changing my slides on that. All right, form submissions. <coughs> How do we submit forms in WordPress? If you want to do a search or add something to your post comment or send a registration, what do we normally do? <laughs> OK. That's one option. That's one option. Um, I like to handle forms with a plugin. Because we plug in all the things here. We plug in everything. Um, what that looks like is this. Uh, first off, we have this bit of code. And we have an action. And we have this action starts out with WP Ajax. That's a function inside of WordPress. And then we get to this underscore, and then something magical happens. We have job search. Job search is my own thing. I made that up. So the way that WordPress works with this function is it says, you need to prefix with WP Ajax, and then underscore, and then anything after that underscore is going to be what you need to use in your form to tell WordPress that that form needs to be processed by this function. All right, this is what's called the form action. All right, the form action. Now there's two form actions being referenced here, one in WP Ajax and one in WP Ajax no priv and then the same thing. Does anyone know why I need them both? Yes. Oh, it's in the code comments. Documentation. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, okay. <laughs> I didn't know I was that good. Um, all right. So uh, we need that variable kind of at the end. That's almost like a variable in this case. It's the form action. So what that looks like in our form, this is our form code here. And we have that job search thing is showing up all sorts of places. The first place it shows up, that no priv reference, remember? And then uh, down here at the bottom, input type equals hidden, and action is job search. So we pass the name of the input as action. We pass the value of the input as job search. That's the connection that happens. This field, action, references that no priv job search up at the top. All right? All of that gets hooked together. Now, the next thing is we have a nunce. Who knows what a nunce is? Yes, back left. Mm -hmm. 
Right, perfect. Okay, so a nunce is what is called a number used once. You just got it? All right, number used once. Does anyone know that it's not actually a number used once inside of WordPress? It's a number used multiple times? It's not used once. It's actually used once per session, which means that you'll get it a couple of times, the same thing. Uh, and do you want to know how I found that out? Because I had someone sit on a form page for over 24 hours with the form open, with their data sitting in it. And then they came back the next day and they hit, and it said, hey, your nuns didn't verify. And they called and they said, why doesn't this work? And I said, I don't know. Let me go look at the code. And I went and spent some time reading about it. I'm like, you must have submitted it and gone back. They're like, no, I just submitted it one time. What had happened is when the form gets generated by WordPress, we have WP nuns field. That generates the nuns right there. Okay, the nuns is generated off of this job search keyword. It uses that in the algorithm to generate the number. All right. What happens is that number will last for 24 hours. You can actually configure that with a filter too. Um, but I thought she had reset the form or done something weird. No, she just sat on the page for 24 hours. The nuns expired. She submitted it, and then she got an error, and she lost all her data. Kind of stinky. Um, the best solution that I can think of for that particular situation. Uh, other than telling the user to not sit on the page for 24 hours, which is what I wanted to do, but my boss said I couldn't, is um, writing some JavaScript which refreshes the page every 24 hours. If you can get over the idea of setting a timeout for 24 hours in JavaScript, which also sounds like a memory leak waiting to happen. Yeah, I, I was uncomfortable with it too. <sighs> All right, anyways, so job search nuns. That's the name of the field that gets generated. So you see how this is input name uh, action. This is going to be input name type equals hidden, and then name is job search nuts. That's what that ends up evaluating to once WordPress processes it. Now, the reason I have them different is because I want you to understand that job search nuts and job search nuts verify up here, or the nuts verify, those things have to match. All right? And then job search everywhere else, that has to match. Uh, but they don't have to be the same thing everywhere. These two things have to be the same, and those two things have to be the same. But that's it. And normally what you'll find if you're looking at examples is everything's the same, and you don't know which one's which. In this case, those two match, and then everything else matches. And that's it. Okay? So how do we handle errors inside of WordPress? When something goes wrong, when things happen, typically we get a SQL error or something like that, something nasty is displayed to the user. It's really, 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 really bad. I want to handle errors in what I call a graceful way. Um, so to do that, I have to play a game of catch. Does anyone know what I mean when I start going this direction? Game of catch? A little bit? PHP has a feature down here called try and catch. All right? And what that basically says is, hey, PHP, I want to try to do this thing. And as long as nothing goes wrong, keep on doing it. And if something goes wrong, here's what I want you to do about it. All right? So take this example. We have a for each statement here. So we don't know exactly what's in this array. We're just looping through an array here. And we're passing this thing called job ID to this other method up here called load job. And we don't know exactly what's in that array. Something could go wrong. We could get an empty value from the database. We don't exactly know. We're just trying to protect ourselves. So in this function I've written, if we don't get a job ID or the job ID somehow evaluates to a falsy value, throw an exception and catch it over here. So whenever we throw something in PHP, we have this thing happening called bubbling up. It's a bubble up. All right? And this throw is going to bubble all the way up through any try catch statements until it's caught. And once it's caught, it's the catch responsibility to do something with that value. In this case, I've chosen to print out the error message and then stop execution. Halt the application. You did something really, really bad. Stop doing what you're doing. All right? Um, now, we don't necessarily have to stop what we're doing. We could do something else. We could log the error to an error log and then keep on processing. We could send me an email and keep on processing. We could display that error message to the user and tell them that they've been a bad person and they should stop. We can do a bunch of different things. We don't necessarily have to just exit. Typically, you want to, but you don't have to. Now, there's another feature inside of exceptions. This is called throwing exceptions uh, that we can do. We can throw different types of exceptions. 
PHP comes with a couple different types. The most common ones that I use are these three, invalid argument, error, and just regular old exception. So uh, I try to think about how I'm gonna use them, and my mental processing is if I'm passing a variable to a function and that doesn't work out, that to me is an invalid argument because something went wrong with the argument. If some error happened, like an SQL error, SQL error, read, write, database issue, I will throw an error exception. And then for everything else I can't possibly think of, I just use regular exception, okay? By having different types, we're able to basically classify how we handle the error by severity. So we can say basic problems like, oh, we couldn't find your avatar in the file system. All right, not a big deal. Log that to an error log somewhere and continue on going. Oh, you just tried to bring down my SQL server by DDoSing me. Major, major issue, stop execution, email the admin, you know, sirens and whistles type of, type of deal. So we can classify things. Now, these things right here, invalid, error, exception, those are classes inside of PHP. Now, what do we know about classes? Classes can be extended, which means we can create our own levels of severity. We can extend these classes, and we can say, I want Chad's version of the invalid error exception. I want this, I want, I want that. We can have different versions, and we can create new classifications based on what our needs are. That's the benefit here. And we have the logging thing. So we can, instead of exiting out, we can just, hey, log that, log those things, and keep on processing. The user doesn't have to know that anything went wrong. You have to know, but they don't. <sighs> okay, next part of this talk, coding comprehension. This is probably my favorite part of the talk, and I'm gonna get really excited. Um, and it's the one that I've stolen the most content from other speakers from, who I have attributed appropriately. I believe very, very strongly that when we write code, it needs to make sense. And I, the reason I believe that is because I've had to jump from project to project to project, written, started by tons of different developers, finished by other developers, and the most important thing to me is getting very, very intimate with the code in a very short amount of time, solving whatever problem or bug that needs to be solved, and then getting out of there really fast. The way that I have to be able to do that is by understanding as much about the code by reading as little of it as possible in the shortest amount of time. And the best possible way that a developer can help me do that is by writing method names that make sense. Method names are so important. Inside of your functions, that function name needs to be so precise and it needs to tell me exactly what it's gonna do and what it's gonna give me in just a couple of words. It's the most important thing. So we have this idea of verb-based functions or functions that describe things. So here's a simple example that I wrote really late one night. Um, take something like a job factory, right? We know that that's a class. What does the phrase job factory tell us about what that code might do? Without ever seeing the code, we kind of already get an idea of what it might be doing. It might be generating some IDs for jobs. It might generate descriptions, things like that. We know it's gonna generate stuff for us. And we know that it takes some value. Something has to make those jobs happen. I made up Obama. Seemed like a good idea. Um, we have another thing over here, job seeker. That's someone looking for a job, right? So we know that if we call this function on create jobs, what's gonna probably end up happening? We're gonna populate maybe a database of jobs. We're gonna get some things going on when we call this function. Without knowing anything about the code that's in the background here, you're able to kind of intuitively know what might be going on inside this code. That's really, really cool. Um, this is a method name that we might have, okay? Get leads. We know immediately uh, we have the verb get, so we're gonna get something back, there's gonna be a response, and we know that we're gonna get a type, all right? So we have get, that's doing something, that's our verb, get something. And then we have leads. That's gonna tell us some sort of data type, right? That's saying, hey, we have this thing called a lead, and we wanna get those. This is pretty good. That tells us we're getting something, it tells us what we're getting. But what it doesn't do is it doesn't tell us anything about what else might be associated with a lead. Because let's think about leads, for example. In this case, I'm talking about leads in sales, okay? So we can probably do better. What if we had this sort of database structure? We have leads as a table, we have recruiters as a table, and then we have a table that solves this many-to-many -many issue and says we have a leads to recruiter 
uh, key, key by value system here. And what that basically means is that we have multiple recruiters and multiple leads, and leads get assigned to recruiters. That's the kind of functionality that this suggests. All right? A good method name here might be get lead by ID. So that tells us we're going to get one lead. It tells us that we're going to reference that lead by its database ID. We also have get leads by recruiter, which goes back to suggesting what sort of relational database structure that this has. We know we're going to get leads, but we're going to get a specific recruiter's leads. We could even call this, by the way, get recruiter or get leads by recruiter ID if we wanted to specify an ID. So you can use field names inside of here. Get by ID, get by name, get by email, get by anything, right? Um, so get leads by recruiter. And then we can do like the inverse of that, get recruiter by the lead. So find out who this recruiter is by looking at this lead ID. So this helps us establish a lot of different things about the relationship of the data behind the scenes. I don't have to go look at the database to know what it is. I just know that by using these types of words, I'm able to figure out what might be going on. Those are the three sections that didn't matter. Um, some other examples. Find by recruiter, so we're looking for something. Add recruiter to lead, we're inserting things into the database. Um, sort, some sort of filtering sorting function. Those things could be adjusting a SQL query or things like that. All those things really help me in understanding what these functions are going to be doing. Okay, next part. Again, this is my favorite part. I want to talk about code constructs, how code is written and um, what it looks like and how we can make it easier for our brains to comprehend. And the reason that this is important is because as developers, we're basically human processors or parsers for PHP. As we're writing code, we're doing like three different things. We're solving the problem, we're figuring out uh, what this code is going to do as we're writing it, so we're parsing it, and we're actually like actually trying to type at the same time. That's like three heavy duty tasks all at once. All right. And the only thing that you can do to make that more difficult for yourself is by writing really complicated code that you have to read later. So I have to confess this to you. I've really been lazy, and I have not written an else keyword inside of an if statement in over two years. Think about that for a second. What does that mean? I don't use the else keyword inside of if, so I don't do if and then else. I just do if, 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 if all in a row. That means that as I'm doing comparisons, I have one thing in my brain. What did that do? Okay, next thing. What did that do? Okay, next thing. What did that do? I don't have to do if this, and then if that other thing, and then if that one other thing, and then else otherwise do that. That's like tracking different things inside your head in the different states of those variables. That's a mess. No one wants to think about all that stuff. So here's an example of how you do that. This is a very simple statement. If this recruiter do something and then return the results out of the function. Otherwise, throw an exception. How can we eliminate the else from this kind of function? How can we get rid of it? It's pretty simple. Does anyone want to take a stab before I... Go ahead. Then throw the else, then, then do, then throw the exception. Yeah, so I think you're on the right track. Um, this is what I would do. If not, or if empty, right? If not, throw the exception. Then get, get done with that. We, we threw the exception first, and then actually processing. So we validated the input first, and then we did our operation after that. All right? So there's three kind of rules that I follow, or three different logical things that I go down to solve these sorts of problems. Validate your input first. So validate any arguments you have first. Do that first thing. Get that stuff out of the way. Throw your exceptions. Return false if you need to. All that good stuff. Return early. That means using that return statement inside of your function and do that first and last, basically. So you can have multiple of those. Now, old school programmers will tell you not to have multiple returns, and I think in probably Visual Basic and some other languages you're not allowed to. Um, and there are arguments to be made that if you have multiple returns, then how do you know which one's getting hit? Well, the answer is logging there, but basically um, I do this as necessary, all right? Return early and then process last. Do your actual operation as the very last thing that happens inside your code. Um, here's another example. This one's a little more complex, um, and I don't remember exactly what it's supposed to do, but it, 
it uh, kind of does all the things that I talked about. So first off, throw, throw those exceptions early, validate the input first, return early when we need to, and then actually do the operation and process things and return last. That should be the last thing that we do. All right, so no else keyword. You can do this. You can eliminate else keyword from your, your PHP vocabulary, and you should. All right, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that next. Here's another rule that I follow, okay? Two levels of indentation. Does anyone know what I mean by when I say two levels of indentation? Nesting, right, exactly. So here's an example. We have a class, and I don't count the class as an indentation, and I don't count the function as an indentation. I count the body of the function as level zero, all right? So the first level is if statement. So that's one level of indentation in. The next level is the for each. That's two levels. Then the third level is right here. So it looks like I probably need those levels. I have to check and make sure that I have a valid thing before I try to process it, all that good stuff. Well, what we could do is we could change that around to look like this. So first off, I check whether or not this thing was true, and then if not, I turn, return an empty array. Why would I do that? Return an empty array? Well, if you look here, I declare an empty array. And then if this isn't valid, I return that same empty array. So if this didn't get hit, that array is going to be empty anyways. So I can return early, just return an empty array, then whatever this is supposed to be returning is going to get sent up. So if it's expecting an array, it's going to get one. It may not have anything in it, but at least it, it got the right data type. Uh, and then I just have the two levels of indentation, the for each, and then if this was valid, go ahead and put it in the array, and then I'll actually get something out of that array when it returns. So we can solve the else keyword, get rid of the else keyword, delete it from your brain. You don't need it. I promise you, you don't need it. Over two years, I've done it, you don't need it. Okay. That type of thing, removing the else keyword, is going to force you to do a couple of things. You have to create more functions, because it's the only way to get rid of the else keyword. You'll go, I can't possibly do this because I need that else keyword. Well, what do you have to do? Your code's probably doing too much stuff in one function. Create another function offload that operation to another function. It will force you to be more object-oriented. It'll force you to create more functions and do less things inside the functions that you have. It'll force you to throw more exceptions. You'll have to do this. You just have to. It's the only way to solve the problem. You have to do this. This forces you to make good coding decisions as you're going along. It puts you in a box, and as long as you stay inside that box, you're in a really good box. It's a good box to be in. Okay. And you'll have to think about less code. You have to think about less potential things going wrong or less potential um, cases of variable states happening all at once. All right. Now for the final part. And this is going to be the extreme part. This is like going beyond. Going beyond no else. And that's pretty extreme. Going beyond that. This is what I call the nitpicking. Um, this is where things get really like, really? You're going to really make a big deal about that? I can't believe you would do that. All right. Doc blocks. Um, who knows what a doc block is or what it does? A couple people. All right, cool. Here's an example of a doc block. The structure of a doc block is very, very simple. It starts out with the slash two stars. That's a PHP code comment, right? And it has a description. And it's a one sentence thing that says what the function does. And then it has this thing called at param, which references the arguments in the function. Excuse me. It references the arguments in the function. And the at param will give us a couple things. It tells us the type of input that we expect that argument to be. And it describes it a little bit and says what it's supposed to be kind of in English. Uh, pretty simple. So string, that means we're expecting something in quotes. Integer, that means we're expecting a number. Um, we could pass also array and a few other things that I think possibly floats. PHP 7 is going to give us a whole bunch of type base, uh, types, so you'll be able to use all those eventually. Um, if you're throwing any exceptions, you can say, hey, this throws this type of exception. It throws this kind of exception. And then also, what are we going to get out of, out of the end of it? Um, I tend to always put what I'm going to return. And some developers will say, you should only ever return one type of data from your function. That's also from Visual Basic type stuff. I don't follow that strictly. I will say that if I'm going to return more than one data type, I'll only ever return two. The one that it could be, and something went wrong and false. 
So those are the two types that I would have. So in this case, it's either an array or it's false. If I'm returning those two types, I'll put at return mixed, and then I'll actually specify the types that I'm going to have. So array separated by a pipe or a brace, and then the actual thing, which would be a false. Um, those are the two things that I will accept, and that's, that's the exception. That's it. Always return exactly what you're going to be returning out of here and reference what it's going to be. Now, how many people saw the PHP Storm talk a few seconds ago, or before this one? Yeah? Did you love it? I love PHP Storm, okay? And I was so happy someone did one because I wanted to talk about it, but I clearly don't have enough time. Um, if you use this nomenclature inside of your code inside, uh, inside of PHP Storm, as you're referencing the methods in PHP Storm, it'll actually type hint when you start typing. It'll say, hey, you're about to use that get indenture names function, which takes a string and an integer. So make sure you have those handy when you start using this function. You don't have to go look at the function. It'll actually tell you the little description and the little type hint window. It's wicked, wicked awesome. It's really efficient for this sort of stuff. And it helps you know a lot about your code without seeing a lot of it. Last and final point is going to be code style. And this is where we get really nitpicky, like grammar level in your code nitpicky. All right, there is a tool called PHP Code Sniffer. Has anyone heard of this tool? One, two, three, four people. Okay, Code Sniffer. Who knows what it does or how it works or use it? Anyone use it? You use it? Awesome. Um, PHP Code Sniffer is a tool uh, that is started out as a command line interface tool. And what it does is you can point it at a directory of code, and it'll scan every single file inside that code, and it checks every line every line down to like the line endings and everything there possibly could be about that file and it tells you what you did wrong um, and it will check your doc blocks to make sure your doc blocks are structured correctly it'll check that you're using um, returns properly that your data types are referenced properly it gets really really specific about what you're doing you can use PHP code sniffer on your code on top of that uh, after you get it installed you can use the WordPress rule set there is an official word, uh, rule set for WordPress for WordPress plugins. If you install the WordPress rule set, it will verify that your code matches the official code style for WordPress, like what everyone's supposed to follow. And it will get it down to the most minute detail. Here's a function inside of PHP. That doesn't really look all that bad. Like, it's okay. It makes sense. It has some comments. There's a couple of functions. That's perfectly readable, I think. Here's everything that PHP Code Sniffer found wrong about it. The first thing it says, PHP Code Sniffer is not camel case caps format. What does that mean? Here's the code again. What does that error message mean? PHP Code Sniffer, the P is lowercase. It's telling me that I'm not using an uppercase character? That's how nitpicky this is. All right. Uh, doc block is empty, uh, opening brace should be on the same line. Wow, that's really nasty. Okay, 17 errors. And that little tiny, that was like a 12-line thing. I have 17 errors. All right, so how do we fix them? So the first thing, the class name is not uppercase, all right? That's that thing. That's that character. We just have to make it uppercase. Ding. Now we're down to 12 errors. That's it? That was really easy. I think I fixed one other thing there. Uh, maybe not. Let me see. Oh, this is the other thing that I fixed. Notice the brace uh, formatting here. I have the brace on the same line as the function. This is complaining um, opening brace should be on the same line. It's telling me that I shouldn't have that on line 21. I should have it on line 20. Nitpicky. So I fixed that. What else do I have wrong here? Okay, function name get jobs is a camel case format. And it actually gives me a suggestion. How nice. OK. So I, get, I have to lowercase that, separate it by an underscore, rather than using the camel case format. The reason for that is WordPress says that you have to do that. Now, I'm an opinionated person. I've been writing code for a long time. And I do not necessarily agree with that as a code style. And in actuality, at work, I went and I deleted this rule from the rule set because I don't want to follow it. And I had written a lot of functions that had not followed that, and I didn't want to change them all. But I actually just read a study that was done. People study this stuff for real. And they found out, and um, if you look on Twitter, you'll find this study. I tweeted about it. 
uh, I'm sorry, I don't have the, the note for it. But they found out that people who use what's called snake case, which is that underscore, that's called snake case, rather than camel case, are able to read and comprehend code 20% faster by using snake case. They studied that. That's crazy. So I'll, WordPress wins according to the official like document that proves that, that you can read the code faster. It's going to be really hard for me to break like 10 years of, of writing code this way. Um, all right, what else is it complaining about? No space after the opening parenthesis. Okay, that one's a weird one. I think this one's weird. What that's saying is that for this function call get jobs, it wants a space before and after the variable. So parenthesis, space, variable, space, close parenthesis. That's what it's expecting there. That's pretty extreme. The reason for that is very simple. It helps your eye see what's going on there. It helps your eye pick it out. I understand the reason. Really hard for me to do that one as well. Um, but I do do that one, that one I follow. So we fixed all this up. We fixed all the things wrong with it. We made it underscore. We added the doc block, we added the filter thing. We fixed all that good stuff. Now we're happy. I think all these things added up will make us better developers. I think all these things will help you be a better developer citizen. People will be able to read your code faster. They'll be able to read it more efficiently. You'll be able to get in, get out. You won't have as many bugs because your code's going to be that much better. You're not going to have else's to deal with. It's going to be awesome. All right, here's the takeaway challenges I have for you all. Don't use the else keyword. I challenge you. I challenge anyone. Do this for one month. Do this for one month. Just sit down and say, I'm going to try it. I literally, I saw this in a talk. I went home. I was like, that seems really hard. And I did it for a while. And then I kept on doing it. Then I kept on doing it. And now I'm prophesizing about it. Like, it's amazing. It's awesome. Just do it, and you'll feel really, really happy. And if you do it, you'll make someone else really happy. I'll tell you about him in a second. His name is uh, Raphael, and he's the one who came up with this, this particular set of rules. Um, he brought them in from Java, I think, into the WordPress world. And I have a reference on his talk, which goes into a lot more detail about those sorts of things. All right, two levels of indentation. That's also a really tough one. Actually, I think the, the, the preferred is three levels, especially if you have a try-catch and you're doing stuff in there. You could go to three levels. I actually do think I stick to two pretty well. I went and looked at a bunch of my code to see, and I can only find two, so apparently I'm really good at that one. Um, and then the last one, which I know is going to be probably the most tough for WordPress people, don't put functionality inside your theme. Thank you guys so much. Uh, here's some resources for you. Object-oriented calisthenics, Raphael Domes. He's the guy who says don't use else in your, uh, in your if statement. Check out his, co uh, his talk here. It's called Your Code Sucks, Let's Fix It. It's a little bit rude. But it's a really good talk. You'll learn so much from it. I really, really did. Um, this other website right here called PHP the Right Way tells you about some stuff you really never wanted to know, like dependency injection and all that good stuff. Thank you so much.